I'm going to start with um, the Babylon Bee Guide to All the Different Christian Denominations. For those of you that are not familiar with the Babylon Bee, it is a satire website. I shared it with, with Corey. And uh, so are you ready? This is your guide to all the various, de- not, not all of them, but most of them. Are you ready? Wake up. <laughs> all right, here's, the, here's your guide. Catholics, if you have an affinity for Latin, guilt, and booze, go, go Catholic. The Catholics started off with an epic 1,500-year run keeping the denomination game on lockdown before Luther came along in the fourth quarter and messed everything up. Generally seen by Protestants as just one rung above Mormons on the are-they-really-Christian scale, Catholics are known for having lots of rules and praying to Mary and saints for some reason. Weird. Anglicans. Anybody have Costco memberships? All right. Anglicans are Kirkland brand Catholics. <laughs> Episcopalians are Kirkland brand Anglicans. Eastern Orthodox are Catholics but with way cooler beards. Methodists, these folks branched off from the Anglican church after it became too boring but hung on to all the great church traditions like organ music, legalism, and holding rummage sales. And if you hold a biblical view of marriage, there's good news. There are still Methodist churches in Africa and Korean you can go to. (laughs) If you're familiar with the Methodist church, that's true. Baptist, do you hate dancing, rock music, and Dungeons and Dragons? Boy, oh boy, do we have the denomination for you. Baptist churches are trying to move into the 21st century with guitars and drums, but the church secretary, Ethel, sure is upset about it. One bonus of being Baptist is you can kind of believe whatever because the pastor probably doesn't even know what the church's statement of faith is. I don't know if that's true. Hey, this is not me. Don't kill the messenger. Evangelical non-denomination, undercover Baptists, which is true. If you go to most of your non-denominations, they're all Baptists. Not all, but most of them. Lutherans, are you ready for this one? All the boring parts of Catholicism married to all the boring parts of Protestantism. (laughs) The The original Protestants, the Lutheran Church, began in 1963, shortly following Martin Luther's I Have a Dream speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Which, by the way, when I was a chaplain in the army, I was asked to speak for Martin Luther King Day because I was Lutheran. I had to inform them it's not together. Anyway. In order to join, a person must be at least 70 years old, live in Lake Wobegon, and have a bizarre obsession with (laughs) Jell-O. Presbyterians, carriers of the moniker Frozen Chosen due to their Calvinist beliefs and catatonic state, Corey, Presbyterians were predestined to become the denominational equivalent of stale toast. Forget raising your hands during worship, if so, if you so much as show the slightest emotion with your facial expression, you will be flogged by a deacon. Decent beard game. Is that true? Decent beard game? Okay. Mormons. Hey, we said Christian denominations. Meeting anyway. Pentecostals. A denomination started in the early 20th century. Attending a Pentecostal worship service is like going to a drug-fueled rave. For Jesus, what's not to like? And best of all, if you don't like what Scripture says, Just have your own personal revelation and write it right in the back of your Bible. Calvary Chapel, I'll close with this. Whoa, man, we're totally not a denomination, dude. Come on, bro, we're just like chill Christian dudes hanging out. Are you familiar with Calvary Chapels and all? Yeah. Yeah. Southern California is just, that's their Becca. And uh, very chill. Out and out on Jesus and surfing and stuff, gnarly. Anyway, there's some other stuff in there. Oh, last one, Unitarian Universalist, see Atheist. <laughs> All right. They do not, because as they said with Mormonism, hey, we said Christian denominations. So. All right. Cal- oh, is that right? Yeah, Calvary Chapel... Uh, anyone remember the 60s? 
and the Jesus movement. Uh, you just had to have a guitar, and you can get a lot of people in church. But um, but Calvary Chapel uh, grew or began in, in Southern California with a bunch of just disenfranchised uh, hippie kind of surfers, and and really uh, was a movement that when the charismatic movement became uh, a little too um, influential, I guess, in some ways, they broke off and became what's known as the Vineyard Church. I don't know if there's Vineyard Churches around here or not, but anyway. And they had their own, they, they had their own uh, Christian music label, Maranatha, uh, which means Come Lord Jesus, and very prevalent in, in Christian music for at least a decade, um, so forth and so on. Anyway, here we are. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of John today, and let's pray. Lord, thank you for gathering us today as we are around your word. We pray that you open up our our minds to understand more fully the glory that you've revealed to us through your Son, through your Spirit, and as you teach us through your written word. May what we learn today transform how we think and be, so that all that we can say and do and think give glory to who you are. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, last week I believe we did cover chapter one and focused uh, on specifically the the Lamb of God uh, declaration that uh, John gave during the baptism. We've talked about John, although there's not biblical uh, attachment to it in terms of what what could have very well probably been the case in terms of him going off into the desert until the time of his ministry. We talked about why that was important as it re- relates to baptism um, as a ritual that we still adhere to. So I'm going to then skip down to, still in chapter 1, but now down to verse 43. And um, start there today. And go from, from there. This is then verse 43 of chapter 1 of John. <coughs> Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, which is north of Judea. You have Judea as a territory that also includes uh, Jerusalem that was called Judea because it was Judah at one time, and most of the returning Jews had settled in that area, and so the Roman Empire named that area uh, Judah. Just north of Judah is Samaria, and then just north of Samaria is Galilee. These are all territories. By the way, after Rome made the decision to completely level Jerusalem, they wanted to eradicate any of the Jewish influence in that area, so they no longer called it Judea. They instead referred to it, does anyone have recollection? Palestine, as an area, Palestine refers to the Philistines. Philistines originally were Greek pirates that came from the Greek islands, crossed the Mediterranean, settled in the, on the coast, and would rob and pillage and do their thing. And if you take a look historically at when Israel went into the Promised Land, to the west were the Philistines, and that's who they uh, would often engage in. All right, so verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He has to go through Samaria, and I will get to that later. But finding Philip, and I would uh, begin to take note as to his relationship with Philip. It's very unique. It's very, um, very close. They are um, good friends, and... Um, Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Now, when Jesus says follow, um, there's, there's, a, there's a distinct meaning to that. Because this area had been 
it's always conquest. So you have different people that were settled, and when uh, it was time for Israel to go into the land, under the leadership of Joshua, Joshua said, okay, follow me, because you don't go in to conquer a land without a leader. And then, of course, if you uh, remember the history of Israel, it kind of goes back and forth, dip different incursions. But then in 722, the Assyrians come in, and uh, they, they take most of the northern kingdom, and they begin to occupy it. And then in 586, the Babylonians. So there's always a leader that you follow to conquer a land. Then after the Babylonians had conquered the land, then the Persians came in and took over. And then after the Persians came in, a um, person of history, Alexander the Great from Greece, uh, came in and took over that whole land in a very short amount of time and started to uh, create the Greco-Roman, later became the Roman Empire. And, um, and so with each wave, there's this follow me. Included with the follow me is we're going to conquer something. It's not just follow to hang out. Okay, following always includes purpose and, 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 and some kind of joint effort. How do, how do we put them together? Oh, well, by the language that they speak and the distinctive marks that they would have into a territory. It, any army that comes in is going to have a very distinct, you know, banners and flags and apparel and, and things of that nature, yeah. So, he grabs Philip. Now, Philip, um, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. That area is... Um, in Galilee, uh, along the area of the uh, Sea of Galilee, or the Sea of Tiberias. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, that's a, that's a loaded uh, when you talk about follow me, it's a loaded declaration. Number one, um, Moses said, and holding our spot here, I'd like to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18. And when you get to that chapter in Deuteronomy, uh, scroll down, if you will, to verse 14. And that's what we're going to take a look at today, or, or, or right now. So this is verse 14. The nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. And this, this is very important, um, this, this practice that, that the Lord refers to. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from among your own brothers, you must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb, another word for Sinai, Th those two are used interchangeably, on the day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. Um, I believe that's Exodus uh, 17, 18, around there. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. We talked about God's word yesterday. 
and the importance of it. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? Here's the answer. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. It's called 2020 hindsight. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Well, that, <laughs> that may not be the deciding uh, factors that you want to base your determination on. Let's just see what happens. But this is how the Lord works. It's, it's, not, it's a discerning process. And when a, when a prophet is speaking, I was just talking with Kyle about this just the other day. We are talking about Isaiah. Um, you don't know if it's going to play out until it plays out. Um, the book of Jeremiah, all that was written down, could have easily been discarded and never attributed as Scripture if what he had to say never happened. Jeremiah was thrown in, into a cistern because he predicted the fall of Jerusalem. Nobody wants to hear that. Who wants to hear that? So there's more than enough voices out there, prophetic voices that will tell you what you want to hear. And in Jeremiah's time, that was the case. So they threw him in the cistern. Well, guess what? Jerusalem fell. We better probably take his book and now we're looking for what he had to say with regards to after it falls, what's going to happen. So this is how prophetic writings, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, to comprehend the importance of the prophets because, in part, like me, if you grow up in church, the authority of the church can be the authority by what we base the authority of Scripture. And I, I mean, I remember, I, was, I don't know why I was thinking this the other day, but I remember as a little kid going in the office and there was the, the pastor's office. You opened it up and there was a desk and he had a pipe and he had, a, he had uh, books and, 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 and we're gonna, I'm going to study for the sermon at this time so nobody's disturbed and you know, and then he's got his, his place where the robes are, and that gives it the sense of authority, okay? But that's not what Jews had with regards to the leading of their, of their nation. They had priests, but priests were not prophets. They could be prophets, but their function was directly related to the temple worship. They were to teach the law. What you can eat, what you don't eat, the kind of sacrifices for the various festivals of the seasons of the year. What you can wear, who you can marry, what happens if you get sick, what happens when you get well. These were the responsibilities of priests. But the actual day-to-day -day decisions in terms of the direction of Israel, that was given to the prophets. And Moses is, in part, <clears throat> the model, if you will, I, the example. Jesus says, I've set you an example. Moses was the example. This is what a prophet will look like, will perform, will speak on behalf of God, and there will be miracles that take place. By the way, I'm going to talk about miracles today. That's the kind of the focus that I'm trying to make our way towards. But um, th th it will be like me, and, and I will listen to God and speak on behalf of God, and 
And as such, Israel will be led in that manner. So that was God's arrangement. And if you take a look through the period of the judges, judges are not judges as we understand judges. They don't sit behind benches with wigs. We don't have any wigs anymore, but you know what I mean and declare what is the legality of certain issues that come before them. Judges, it's better probably to use the term ruler because they gave guidance, they gave decisions, of course, but, but they gave guidance as to the direction of Israel, what they were to do if a certain enemy approached them, and et cetera, et cetera. But the leading of Israel was intended from the beginning to take on the form of prophetic vision according to the prophets. It's only after Rome takes on the church that the authority becomes in part because Rome says so. And then you have various leaders that take on the responsibility in their mind of the defender of the faith. Have you ever heard that term? So in Martin Luther's time, he goes to the prince, and the prince has taken on, we call that the divine right of kings. I have the divine right to rule over this kingdom because I am also a, the defender of the faith. None of us think that way now. None of us refer to that anymore. But that, for the longest time, was the dominant paradigm in which people worked. So when... when, when you get Gen or Deuteronomy 18. This is what is put in place. So when Israel asked for a king, God said, okay, I'll give you that structure, but you only get the king that the prophet anoints. Remember, the first king was Saul, and the first manner of anointing him was through the prophet Samuel. And so you've got two books dedicated to him, First and Second Samuel. And then from Samuel, it's always the prophet's. So, that being the case, going back to John, who's they? Are you asking or are you telling? Curious? Um, no, kings were anointed, which is the Jewish term for anointing is Messiah. The Greek word for anointed is Christos or Christ. But not baptism, no. So when he finds Nath uh, Nathaniel in verse 46, now we'll go back a little bit, for verse 45, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about. That's Deuteronomy 18. In the law. And about whom the prophets, this is the next, Moses and the prophets, two different, although Moses is a prophet, wrote about Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, when he's talking about the prophets, he's talking about the expectation. Remember what I said? We went back to Moses and <clears throat> um, Israel said, or through Moses, God said to Israel, I will raise up a prophet like Moses who will lead your people. Ah, for goodness sake. Moses' role as prophet was to deliver God's people from slavery. So by definition, the prophet's role included deliverance. Now, in 722... Northern Kingdom is abolished, taken into captivity, deported, exiled by the Assyrians. Sennacherib, or Sen I don't know how you want to pronounce it, that's how I pronounce it. 586, Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar. Now Israel is completely in exile. They don't have a land. They don't have a country. They don't have any area. So from this place, they're wondering, is God done with us? 
do we have any favor? Is, are we done? Is that it? Bear in mind that this was predicted by the prophets. Well, not by the prophets, but by God through the prophets. God said, I set before you life and death, but I know you're going to choose to turn away from me and break the covenant. When you do, I'll hear you. And there's this kind of clause, if you will. But they're wondering, well, who am I? Let me ask you this. Some foreign nation comes in and just decides through our technology to shut everything down unless we turn everything over, our government over to whatever they do. And let's say we have the courageous political leadership that we do, and they turn it over. The rest of us are going, well, then what does that mean? Who are we? Does God have any plan for us? These are the Christians. If you're non-Christian, you just prep, I don't know what kind of questions you ask, but is there, is there any meaning to, to our history anymore? Were we just a blip on a screen? Are we going to be restored? I mean, it, they're, they're very real issues. Especially if, if the particular invading country comes and it just takes all of your land away and says, by the way, this is our land. You don't own any land. And then they, they, they transport you to their land and then now you're in a foreign land, which is what took place. Your, your whole mentality is, I don't even know why I exist, why I'm here. I thought we were God's favorite. I thought we were, what does this mean? And at that point in time, you go back to the prophets that foretold all this and said, we better, we better look at these and see what they have to say about our future. So we go and what does Isaiah have to say? Because Isaiah prophesied before this even happened. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied while this was happening. Daniel prophesied after this happened. Ezekiel prophesied after this happened. But all within this time frame, the whole point of the prophet is, do we have a future? And invariably, every prophet that predicted the disaster and catastrophe that actually took place also gave vision of a future of restoration. It came by way of a Messiah. That's why when he says in verse 45, Philip, Philip now. This is Philip. We found the one Moses wrote about in the law. That's, that's, that's a pretty strong statement. And about whom the prophets also wrote. You found the one that is going to usher in, follow in, conquer, conquer the oppressor. You found the one? Fantastic. Who is it? Jesus of Highlands. <laughs> He's all tatted up, right? Real Linda. Same kind of thing, you know, d different areas have different uh, um, prejudices, I guess, to them. So the response then from Na uh, Nathaniel, Na are you, what? Nazareth. And the question, can anything good come from there? That's a good question. Nathaniel asked. Well, come and see, said Philip. So when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false, who he is as an Israelite. And this is important. He is pro-Israel from head to toe. He hasn't compromised. The big issue that was taking place is for those Jews who have compromised their Judaism to fit in with the oppressor and to kind of become like them because in that way, they defiled the covenant that God originally made with them. So they were no different than the generations that turning away from God allowed this and this to happen. 
you find that a, a particular political leader is making millions of dollars from a foreign entity who does not have the, the America's interest in mind, there's a disdain, not from the news media, they'll cover it, but disdain from the people. And rightfully so. They are betraying. They are a traitor, if you will. And so when Jesus says, here's a true Israelite, he's saying that with a sense of identity and not admiration per se, but a recognition of his character. He won't sell out. That's what it means, a, 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 to, to not sell out. And he admires him for that. So, how do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. He just flat out makes that declaration. He was asked to follow. He recognized, yeah, this is the guy that's going to lead us. Then, Jesus' response in verse 50 you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, this then goes back to, if you hold your spot, we're going to go back to Genesis. And we're kind of doing a comparison, if you will, side by side to see the linkage, not really comparison, but to see the linkage. And this time we're going to go, we're going to um, scoot forward in Genesis and get to 30, oh. Uh, we're going to go back. So, 20, oh, let's see, 28, 28. So in 28, Genesis 28, verse 10, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran, or Haran. This is because if he stayed, his brother was going to kill him because he stole the inheritance. It's a Dateline episode. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set taking one of the stones there, <laughs> as not my pillow. He put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. There is none other than the, this, rather, is none other than the house of God, this is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head 
and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. Ha Beth is house, El is Lord, the house of the Lord, though the city used to be called Luz. Now, this is reference, Jesus making reference to this is a loaded reference. One level of that is that in the midst of disaster, calamity, that Jacob had brought upon himself to the extent that he had to leave his land. You with me? The, to the extent in which Jacob screwed up so bad by being a mama's boy. He should be on Dr. Phil. <laughs> How's that working for you? Anyway. <clears throat> to the extent that Jacob had just brought great calamity into his life, he was forced to leave his land and go to a foreign land. In the midst of fleeing to a foreign land because of what he had done. Israel here, Israel here, in terms of being forced to go to another land. He lays down, and it's not just the vision of seeing that is part of it, but also the reaffirmation of the promise. Even though you screwed up and screwed up bad to the extent that you're going into a land. Remember, you just don't go get a passport, wander around. This is a dangerous place to be whenever you leave your territory. There's just highways that were constantly being robbed, and it really wasn't until the Roman Empire that you had any kind of assembly of, of or semblance rather of uh, safety that you could travel and be somewhat protected. Until then, you 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 leave your homeland. Remember Philistines? They're all over the place. So so Jacob is running, but. In addition to seeing what he saw, he gets the promise reaffirmed. Even though you screwed up, I'm still God, and my promises are still good because while you are unfaithful, I am not. Paul will write about this in his letter to the Romans. Well, if our unfaithfulness makes his faithfulness more more. more obvious why are we being blamed and he kind of goes into that but he makes this paul does makes this this argument if he will in that letter that even though jacob and our ancestors and later israel were unfaithful god is still faithful not to them only but to the promises to his word his word his word, as I said, is more certain than the foundations of the earth. So Jesus now is making this reference. We're going to go back to John. And this is the reference that he makes to Nathaniel. It's not just a flippant, let's go back to a few verses in Genesis it's the promises that God had given to Abraham are being fulfilled. You follow me, I will, I'm going to fulfill all of them. Not just to Israel, but to every nation. Remember the promise? Through you, all nations will be blessed. Maybe not the Norwegians as much. All right. So, you're with me so far, right? On the third day... A wedding took place, this is chapter 2, at Cana in Galilee. So he's, <clears throat> excuse me, he's gone to their hometown, their turf. Cana in Galilee is not on the actual body of water itself. It's more in a valley, uh, but, but, but in the same vicinity of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, 
and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. Already there is at least some recognition of what he's capable of doing as a prophet. Now this is prophets part of let's see it play out in chapter 2. If God's word brought all things into existence his word also brought into existence their properties how they function as the scripture says he holds all things together we would call that laws of physics. It's not just that they exist without any kind of relational qualities. The very relational qualities God brings into existence. Science is simply an attempt to gain knowledge about these relational qualities. What happens if you do this? Oh, this happens. What happens if you do this? This at the scientific method. But the author of those qualities is Genesis, or is, is the Lord. And at the very beginning of John, he makes it a point to say, Jesus is one with God. In the beginning, Jesus. So he's the author. He, can, he has authority over these qualities over these, uh, what we call laws of physics, but relational qualities of existence. So, <laughs> why do you involve me? His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. This is his word. This is why his word is so important. Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So there's six of them. Ceremonial washing is a, is a regular practice um, played out in, at various um, events. In this case, I'm assuming there was some because of the, the gathering, there's a ceremonial washing. Just in the same way that the Jews went up and were ceremonially cleaned before the Passover. There's a ritual to it. There's a, a cleansing to it. So what you have is a number of big um, containers, stone water jars that have dirty hand washed water in it. And I can see that in my mind very clearly because um, as, as a kid, uh, go, you, if you come in uh, from working outside on the farm, they would always have a porch before you went to the house. Now, there's a whole process to this. You've got a, a metal, metal uh, not a grate, but a, a metal plate that's sticking up. You know, anyone know what I'm talking about on this one? So when you take all the crap that you picked up, chicken, pig, whatever, you scrape your shoes off, that's stage one. Okay? Stage two is when you go in, then you take off your shoes. Because you don't want, <laughs> there's still going to be some on there. You take your, okay. Then you go up the stairs, and then there's a sink. And then you wash. And you wash from here to here. And by the time the first adult, probably grandpa, comes in, that water's dirty. But for some reason, rather than drain it and put in fresh water, you just keep it. <laughs> so you get a chance to see how dirty that can get within two washings. This is the stone container the quality that's of water that's in those stone containers. Maybe there's not soap in there, but there's definitely dirty water. 
So he said, this is the second time he's speaking, or the, not, not, uh, not the second time he's speaking, but the second time the reference to speaking comes into play. He said to the servants, fill the water jars. Okay, doesn't make sense. Because if you fill the water jars, the next time you put your hands in, it flows over. You know, if you got a tub, you got that little hole, and a sink, you got that little hole. Do we have those little holes in the men's room, bathrooms? Probably not, because it was water got all over when we couldn't turn it off. But nonetheless, you don't want to fill them to the top. They can no longer fulfill their purpose. They'll make a mess. But you do it anyway because he said it. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Are you out of your mind? Do you know what's going to happen when I give the master the ceremony this water? I'm going to get beat. I'm going to get, I won't be able to, to eat for a day. I mean, there's serious consequences for this. This is not something that you do, oh, okay, no. This is very uncomfortable. No way. No. But they did. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had now been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, because they're familiar with his word. And they are aligning their very being with his word. So there's a realization. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Now, miracles will continue as we go through the Gospel of John. They will continue or, or they will reveal themselves in the book of Genesis, but in a different way. In this way, God's word, and we'll see Jesus um, exercise this, apply this. His word is what uh, the miracle, is how the miracle becomes manifest. The way that the miracle becomes manifest in the Old Testament is through the obedience to God's word that will manifest it, um, not maybe directly or in that time, but in God's timing, in accordance with that timing, but in alignment with his promises. Jesus is exercising his, the word for obedience before Jesus, the obedience comes by way of trusting the promise. But it's still trusting God's word, and that's how it becomes manifest. So miracles. Because God is the author of everything, not just what exists that we can see, but what we can see, and the relational properties, he is free to... Adjust, change, do whatever he wants with them. He, it, they're his. He's the author of it. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. So in alignment with his word, it is not uncommon for Christians at some point in time to experience some kind of miracle. In saying that, sometimes the miracles are such that they will appear to a non-believer as coincidence. 
Oh, you brought out the best wine. Cool. He had no idea, the master of the ceremony, because he didn't know God's word. Only the servants knew. They're not going to tell him because they're not in authority to say anything to him. Servants don't dictate to masters unless requested upon. You don't give me your opinion unless I ask you for your opinion. So in this way, he begins, and it says this uh, is the first of his miraculous signs. What he did as a sign is to take, he could have done anything. He could, anything to make more wine. As an example, <laughs> go fishing, you'll find a fish, open its mouth, and there's a, a coin. But he chose this to demonstrate God's glory. Glory is always relational. Glory is always relational. Jesus says, I have given them your glory and they have received your word. Glory cannot manifest itself individually. It is always relational. And when God is fully manifest in that relationship, it is glorious. We'll get to that in a second. So the miracles in this case is done in alignment with his word. <clears throat> now, by and large, miracles biblically are signs and wonders demonstrating God's authority and the truth of his word. They're not done for the spectacular. It's not a show. It may be a demonstration, but it's not to receive acclamation like, oh, wow. It's, it's to demonstrate, oh, wow. The, the two are, one is to get a crowd so that you get acclamation. One, the other is to establish a relationship. So he'll demonstrate miracles with his, dis and there will be miracles, I guarantee, for every believer at some level, that's just for you. And whether God instructs you to tell somebody about that or not, that's up to God. But as we seek God, there will be miracles that are only given to you for your purpose, for your journey. But, but by and large, miracles will be as a testimony to the unbeliever and this goes back to Moses. Remember, Moses went into <clears throat> to, uh, Egypt, and the first miracle was the river. Not meant for the Israelites. It was good that they were there and saw it, but it wasn't for them. It was to demonstrate to Pharaoh, the unbeliever, not that the Israelites were believers at this point in time, but they had at least the promises of God. And Pharaoh did not believe, so then there was the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, until it broke his will. Not to become a believer, but to stop oppressing God's people. So miracles by and large, it, it, it Miracles are, um, <clears throat> it's not just God's people that experience miracles. There is the manipulation of, from the spiritual realm onto the physical realm 
through the demonic as well and through paganism as well. That's why God says, we went to De- De- Deuteronomy, do not hang out with sorcerers. Do not listen to them. Do not get your palm read. You don't, you shouldn't be. <laughs> do I think that everybody that gets their palm read is going to go and sacrifice their kid to it? No. But it's the seed of doubt. It is the seed of non-godly voices giving you direction. It's the same with tarot cards. It's the same with all of that. And by the way, it's prevalent all over Rancho. Paganism is all over. The church at this point in time in history, no longer called to be denominations for the people that are attributed to that. We got a war on our hands, a spiritual war. (laughs) And whether we want it or not, it's upon us. So the, the battle belongs to the, war, to the Lord, and the battle will necessitate God's people being in complete adherence to his will. And there will be miracles that will take place as signs to this. But generally speaking, God's people don't, They'll, they'll experience miracles, but not in the same way. If you take a look through, through Jesus' ministry, and we'll go through. This miracle was not, was not for, um, well, he was ahead of his time. But when he, starts doing, when he starts performing miracles after the proclamation of his ministry, they're generally for people that don't believe to gain a sense of trust. So when he's in, he's got his disciples. His disciples don't believe. They do and they don't, just like you and I. I believe until I get into a situation that's so fearful that the fear overwhelms me and takes me, desires to have me, own me, own my thoughts, own my body, own my behaviors, my habitual behaviors. But I still believe because that's a gift that God has given me, so how do I exercise that belief in the midst of what my body has been habitually trained to not believe? Through his word, through meditation on his word, through adherence to his word, through um, memorization of his word, through... Uh, solitude, being alone with his word. Um, have you ever been woke up in the middle of the night and you just were hoping to get some sleep because the worry and stress in your life was so great that you just want to put your head down and get some sleep. And then you wake up in the middle of the night and there it is. and You can't sleep. That's God's timing to exercise faith but nobody wants to exercise it at two in the morning (laughs) you know that's not fitting into our schedule but we just saw that that's exactly what he did with Jacob so celebrate that because God is getting your attention to do something miraculous in your life. And the greatest miracle is to be transformed to be the kind of person that is not in bondage to that oppressive worry, fear, accusation, blame, guilt, 